Greetings, everyone, and welcome to R. Kelly Appeal TV, where we discuss topics of Robert Sylvester Kelly's appeal, where it's going, and provide some detailed information for you. And as we talked about last week in episode 19, we were going to move on with the reading of Roller Coaster, I mean, <laughs> Solar Coaster, The Diary of Me by R. Kelly. So we are on the section of Lulu, and I'm going to begin to read now. Um, and here we go. This is being recorded February 20th, 2022. Lulu, I love love. There's no one on earth more romantic than me. I've been in love with love ever since I can remember. I've always loved the idea of having a girlfriend. I love the closeness, the sweetness, holding her hand, kissing her cheek, whispering words of affection, and hearing her say that she feels the same about me. My first girlfriend was named Lulu, and she was so special. Though we were only eight, and it was puppy love, I believe she was my first musical inspiration when it comes to love songs. I can still smell the fragrance of our innocence. Lulu and I had a very special bond that, even at our young age, felt futuristic. Ours was that kind of bond that young people talk about when they say they're going to grow up and get married and just be together forever. And though it sounds much like a fairy tale, it's what me and Lulu believed in our hearts, and nobody could tell us any different. Sometimes Lulu and I would play house. We built a make-believe house out of a big cardboard box that we put in the backyard. We cut out openings for windows and hung fresh paper towels to look like curtains. We took crayons and drew little decorations on the walls. We got a towel to look like a rug and placed it on the ground. We did everything we could to make it pretty. Inside the cardboard box, or inside the cardboard house, we had a make-believe kitchen where Lulu served me a make-believe lunch. We sat on the towel and drank make-believe coffee, just like our mothers did. We just sat there and looked at each other. Lulu had light brown eyes and a smile that made me smile. In our make-believe dream house, Lulu and I made a vow to be girlfriend and boyfriend forever. <clears throat> Let's take a walk, Rob, Lulu said to me one day. I, uh, it had rained earlier, but the sun finally came out and walking sounded good. We left my backyard hand in hand. Little eight-year-old me was floating on love. Across the street on Concord Drive sat Beacon Hill Elementary School. A wire fence had been put to keep kids away from Thorn Creek, which rushed like a river between Beacon Boulevard and the railway line. I like the river, said Lulu. I like looking at the water. Me too. Although there were signs on the gate that said danger, keep out, there was also a hole in the fence that beckoned us in. The rains had swallowed Thorn Creek. The water flowed faster and stronger than normal. We were fascinated just to look down at the water, which had a rhythm of its own. After a while, a bunch of other kids came along. They were laughing and carrying on one of the kids, a big a boy bigger than me said, hey, this is our river. What you doing around here? River belongs to everyone, said Lulu. You can't own a river. Hell, I can't, said the boy as he stepped up to Lulu. I say it's my river and y'all get out. I stepped in front of Lulu and said, we were here first. We're not leaving. Out, the boy screamed. It's our river too, I screamed back. With that, the big boy started pushing and shoving and one of them pushed Lulu so hard she fell backwards into the water. Before I knew it, she was struggling to get out. I reached for her, but the fast moving current stronger after the rain was carrying her away. I didn't know how to swim and neither did she. The other kids were running away and she was screaming, Rob, Rob, and I was screaming, Lulu, Lulu. Suddenly she was out of sight beyond the river's bend. I started yelling out for her. But, it didn't know, but I didn't know what to do. I was scared. I was hysterical. I was jumping up and down after what felt like forever some grown-ups arrived. I explained what had happened and followed them downstream until they came upon a big rock. There was Lulu, her head crushed against the rock. She wasn't talking, wasn't moving, but there was a lot of blood coming from her head. 
Lulu can't be dead, I screamed. But the gash and the blood and the woman, the women moaning told me what I didn't want to hear. I wanted Lulu to come back. Wanted this day to start over. This time, me and Lulu wouldn't go inside the fence. We wouldn't go near the water. We'd go back to our cardboard dream house and sit on our make-believe rug. We'd go there and live happily ever after. Death couldn't be this real. Lulu's life couldn't be snuffed out like this because some fool pushed her too hard. It didn't make any sense. Lulu couldn't be dead. She's alive. I knew that I'd be seeing her smiling eye as soon as I woke up from this dream, but it wasn't a dream. It really happened. That night I was still in a state of shock. Mom sensing what I was dealing with held me close in her arms and said, wasn't your fault, baby. You couldn't do anything to save her. Lulu is in heaven now. She's with the Lord, sweetheart, and you with me. It's okay to cry. Cry all you need to, baby, because I got you. I'm with you. I'm right here. My mother's words helped, but she couldn't change the awful truth that Lulu was gone. I kept seeing her caught up in the current, reaching out for me. I heard her screaming out to me. Watch the river washing Lulu away until she disappeared, gone forever, a beautiful butterfly lost in a raging storm. <sighs> what are your thoughts on Lulu? I'd like to hear them in the comment box below. How do you think he felt at the age he was? Do you think he received counseling during this time? Not to make any of this okay, um, but do you think that he was a victim? at this time. Moving on, the dream. When I was about nine years old, I had a strange dream I'll never forget. I was in this house where everything was white, walls, floors, ceilings, carpet, bricks on the fireplace, curtains at the windows. I saw myself seated at a white piano and playing a song. This was weird because at nine, I didn't know how to play any kind of instrument. But in this dream, the melodies were flying off the keys and filling the room. It was as if I was in the midst of a musical storm. Then suddenly I heard the doorbell. I stopped playing and ran to see who was there. I opened the door, but no one was there. Stretching my neck to look in all directions, I couldn't see a thing. In the distance, though, I heard the faint sound of giggling. I didn't know who it was that was laughing or what they were laughing about. So I went back to the piano and the beautiful melodies and chords to start it back up. Then the doorbell rang again and again. When I got to the door, no one was there except this time the giggling was louder. The third time it happened, I was at the door practically before the bell rang. I desperately wanted to find out who was doing all the giggling. I quickly opened the door and standing there were musical notes, except they were all cartoon characters. I tried to reach out and touch them, but they took off and ran like the wind. I chased after them, giving it all I had, but they were too fast for me. I yelled as loud as I could, hey, uh, who are you guys? They stopped dead in their tracks, turned around and came back to me and said, we're your biggest hit song. Then at the blink of an eye, they ran clean out of sight. I went back to the house and I sat down at the piano and I played a melody that was like no other melody I'd ever heard. I began to sing the hook to the song, but for some strange reason, when I woke up, I could not remember what I was saying in the hook, couldn't remember the words. It would take about 20 years, but the words came back and the dream made perfect sense. Coffee with three creams and six sugars. We moved around a lot when I was young. We lived in the housing projects on 63rd Street on the south side before moving to a small place on 107th and Parnell. Back then, the projects didn't seem as bad as people made them out to be today. My family knew everyone in the neighborhood and everyone in the neighborhood knew my family. We were also always broke or not having the things we wanted, but I remember love taking the place of the material things we wanted or needed. We might not have had the money to put the rent, to pay the rent a lot of times, but when I remember sitting on the porch until one or two in the morning, listening to Al Green or Marvin Gaye and playing cards with my mom and my aunties and cousins, I wish I could have brought that part of my childhood with me into the world of success. Because now that I'm successful, that's what's missing in my life. 
The world I was born in through, though, was filled with its own beauty. In the 63rd Street projects, nothing was more important than the game of basketball. I started hooping when I was five with street ball and haven't stopped since. Hooping was very was everywhere, and me and my brothers would hoop any chance we got. Hooping isn't just a hobby or a sport, it's a way of life. Unlike indoor supervised basketball and street ball, you had to adapt to the rules of the neighborhood where you played. Aggressive hand and leg checking was allowed. You could play full court or half court. Sometimes three pointers were three pointers and other times they were just considered beautiful shots. There were no hardwood floors. When you got knocked down, you landed on concrete or asphalt. Some hood courts had only a rim and a backboard. Instead of the familiar whoosh of the ball through string net, you listened for the clang and the chain or the sweet sound of nothingness as the ball dropped through a netless rim. I love basketball because it helps me blow off steam. It gives me somewhere I can put some space between all the other things going on in my life, even music. Like music, who makes life good? I love it for the fast action and high energy, but I'm gonna be straight. I'm also pretty damn good. Thousands of brothers play better than me, but no one loves the game more. Joanne Kelly knew about me and basketball early on. She had a vision. Mom never looked behind, she looked ahead. She saw something in me that I could have never seen in myself. She understood that I loved basketball more than, the most, that more than most other kids. That's why she encouraged my passion for the sport. She knew that nappy-headed little Rob needed to feel worthy, strong, and proud. She saw how I loved to compete, so she let me play hoop as much as I wanted. Mom and I always had beautiful times together. It could be something as simple as getting up in the morning and walking to McDonald's. She didn't have enough money to buy us breakfast, only coffee for her and the Danish for us to share. To me, that was enough. I just wanted to be with her. She fixed her coffee with three creams and six sugars and tasted it to see if it was sweet enough. She wore this cheap red lipstick and when she tasted her coffee, she left a red mark on the cup. She always asked me if I wanted a sip and I always did. And because I love my mother so much, I always turned the cup to where she had left that red mark. I like to drink from the same spot where she drank. One day, you're gonna be famous, baby, she would say with a smile, but I didn't really know what famous meant. I mean, famous like Al Green, she added, famous like Sam Cooke and Marvin Gaye. See, you got the beautiful little singing voice that that's only gonna get bigger and stronger. And then I'm gonna have enough money to buy you breakfast here every day, right, mom? I would ask, yes, you will, sweetheart. You sure will. My mother would take me back home and after dropping me off, get ready for work, she had a job at the hospital where she was training to be an EKG technician. Before she left, the, she never failed to kiss me goodbye. Be good today, baby, she said, and listen to your grandma. We lived in a typical Chicago three-family building. We called them three flats. Grandma lived with her man, Uncle Carrie, on the top floor. Uncle Carrie owned a TV repair shop, but some of his customers were never happy. They complained that after Uncle Kerry food with their TVs, they worked worse than before. Uncle Kerry said they just didn't want to pay their bills. Grandma was heavy set like mom. I loved her, but the woman had her moods. I could tell when she had her mood swings on because she and Uncle Gary would get to screaming at each other. That usually meant they were already hitting it, hitting the hard stuff. They liked their old granny dad whiskey and by early afternoon, they could be down a bottle already. I told you to fix that TV a month a week ago, Grandma was screaming, and the damn thing still don't work. <laughs> it was working until you started messing with the antenna, Carrie screamed back. You, you the one who done fucked it up. <laughs> me, here you go again, blaming me for shit you can't do. What good are you around here if you can't even fix a goddamn television set? If it's so easy, you fix it. I'll fix you, you son of a bitch. It was World War III. Grandma and Carrie went at it. Something fierce. I couldn't tell if he was beating on her or if she was beating on him. Next thing I heard was Grandma yelling, Rob, Rob, you get up here. I ran upstairs and Grandma told me, go to Mr. 
Eichenberg store, get me a pack of Paul Miles, a hunk of hog head cheese, and some of the moon pies. I waited for money. What you waiting for, boy? Cash money or food stamps? Don't get either. Tell Mr. Eichenberg I'll pay him on the first. I ran over to the store wondering if Mr. Eichenberger would go along with grandma's pay plan and let it slide. He did. Back then, small neighborhood store owners still operated on the basic principle of trust and family ties. You come from good people, he said. Plus, I've never seen you try to steal anything from me, not even a candy bar. Never would do nothing like that, I said. And with that, Mr. Eichenberger gave me an Almond Joy candy bar. Back at the house, after giving grandma her stuff, I heard my stuttering uncle Doug calling me from down in the basement. The basement was his kingdom. N -n -n Need your help, Rob. G -g Get down here, he yelled. Uncle Doug was a, was a mess. He had a big pie belly, wild woolly hair, and smelled like someone's sweaty feet. <laughs> that day, like so many others, drinking wild Irish rose straight out the bottle. He started in with stories about how he'd been shot four different times and stabbed another six times. I'd heard them all before. You call me down to tell me stories, Uncle Doug, I asked. No, boy, I called you down to see if that distant cousin of yours is here. Which one? The one with the big breast. Uncle Doug, why you always want to be looking at big breasts? No, no, no harm in looking. Is, the, is she around? No. Well, I'll just stay down here and let you help me get this job done. What job? This here job behind the milk crates. Uncle Doug, walk over to the other... Um, the end of the basement where he dumped nasty old car seats and junky lamps. Bunches of old records were scattered on the floor, dirt and dust everywhere. When he moved the milk crates, I saw temp skins or German Shepherd lying there. Temp skins asleep, I asked? No, dead. Dead? As in, bitch ain't breathing. <laughs> How'd he die? Accident? What kind of accident? I set some poison in the peanut butter to kill the rats. Killed the temp, temp, stents, temp skins instead. Mom's going to be furious, I said. She loves that dog. She can't know. How's she not going to know? He ain't going to tell her. Oh, you're not going to tell her. When she comes to find out Tempest act, um, temp skins ain't here, what you going to say? You better not say nothing. Dogs disappear. Not this dog. This dog don't even go outside. He going outside now because we burying him in that empty lot down the street. Now put him in his bag and follow me. I follow my uncle's instructions. I knew better than to argue with my elders even when my elders did crazy things. Uncle Doug did the supervising. I did the digging. And after a long while, he managed to bury Timskins. That night when my mother got home, the first thing she asked, where's my dog? She looked at me. I looked away. She called up to Grandma and Carrie. They were asleep from a long day of drinking and fighting. She called down to Uncle Doug, who didn't answer. She looked at me again. You know something, Rob. I can see it in your eyes, she said. You ain't go good at lying. Now tell the truth and shame the devil. Truth is, I hesitated. I wasn't comfortable snitching on my Uncle Doug. I wasn't comfortable snitching on anyone. Truth is what, Mom? insisted. Truth is that Uncle Doug's rat poison killed Timskins. Oh, Lord, she cried. Now I'm going to have to go down there and kill Uncle Doug. Next thing I heard was a big commotion from the basement. My mother was down there chasing Uncle Doug, and Uncle Doug was doing all he could to duck and hide. You can run, bastard, she said, but you can't hide. Your boy's lying, Uncle Doug lied. I didn't kill your dog. My boy don't ever lie to me, said Joanne Kelly, and never will. There's only one motherfucking liar around here, and that's you. Now, you gonna get me a new dog, or I'll kick your sorry ass from here to Mississippi. By noon the next day, Uncle Doug was presenting Mom with a newborn mongrel puppy. Okay, so here we're gonna stop. <clears throat> we're gonna meditate on what was actually going on in... R. Kelly's life and this next section which is still under act one is going to be a little graphic it's going to be a little sexual um, so if you do have children around that would be listening during this um, segment please do not let them hear this um, it's going to be a little graphic I'm going to be as 
ungraphic as I can, but uh, the book gets good. And I just want to keep reading it because this is my first time reading Solar Coaster, The Diary of Me by R. Kelly. And it's a powerful piece. You know, um, I'm getting a little bit more into into the touch of who he was as a child you know you you see this grown man with all this ability to sing and do the things that he has done and then even hear what has been said of his convictions and you ask yourself how did he get there so we have to start back from the very beginning and work our way through. So I thank you so much for liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing these podcasts and stay with me on this because as the appeal comes forth and more information is uh, shared with uh, Bonjean, attorney Bonjean, then I will be sharing them as well. And right now she has gotten... She wrote too much of a motion and this judge is refusing to allow her the opportunity to present that. So she has until February 28th to represent. Um, there's a lot of rules and technicalities in the documentation of motions and pre pre-trial, um, you know, uh, documents that we have to sign and everything has to be briefed. It has to be based on uh, a type of font. Um, how many, if it's going to be double spaced, you know, all these things are very important because they're the difference between winning and losing just time to present the evidence to help him win. So I know that's very tacky <laughs> because she could have overruled that she could have allowed it in but um that's not what she says she normally does so she has until the 28th it's no big deal you know it's just a process of putting the paperwork in a more condensed format and then submitting it back during its due date so yeah so tell me what you guys think about this chap this section of act one um, of solar coaster. I, I, I just, I can't wait to hear everybody's comment. Um, let me know what you're feeling. And if that, if anything has jogged your memory that you heard from some of the women that they, that talked on the docuseries or anything during the conviction, if something arises in this, let's plug it together. And this could possibly help Bonjean get to the areas of understanding because I don't know if she's read all this stuff about him. He's been a superstar for a very long time and I don't know if she followed him too much, but this is something that we can do as Kelly Nation supporters. Thank you so much. And as always, keep it 100 positively and think on a very positive basis for Robert Sylvester Kelly during his trial time and his appeals um, time moving into the Chicago case. Thank you so much and we'll see you on the next episode.